The consulting business has sort of an old saying that says that clients want three things from a consultant. They want fast, cheap, and good. Well, fast, cheap, and good, three things you want, but you can only have two. You cannot have all three, right? Because if it's fast and cheap, it will be bad. Or if it's fast and good, well, then it will be expensive and so forth. Now, the thing about actual usability studies is you can actually, you can have all three. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to Notes of Design. Wish you all a very happy new year and it's a great honor and pleasure to start this new year by hosting Jacob Nielsen, a usability pioneer with 41 years of experience in UX and founder of UX Tigers. He founded the discount usability movement for fast and cheap iterative design, including the heuristic evaluation and 10 usability heuristics. He formulated the famous Jacob Laws of Internet User Experience and was also named the King of Usability by Internet Magazine, the Guru of Web Page Usability by the New York Times and the next big thing to a true time machine by USA Today. Previously, Dr. Nielsen was a Sun Microsystems Distinguished Engineer and a member of research staff at Bell Communications Research, the branch of Bell Labs owned by the regional Bell operating companies. He is the author of eight books including the best-selling Designing Web Usability, The Practice of Simplicity which was published in 22 languages and Usability Engineering and the pioneering hypertext and hypermedia, published two years before the web launched. Dr. Nielsen holds 79 United States patents mainly on making the internet easier to use. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Human Computer Interaction Practice from ACM SIG CHI. Buckle up designers, in this episode we crack open the UX world from humble beginnings to shaping the digital world, dive into Dr. Nielsen's inspiring journey, heed the master's voice, get actionable tips to launch your UX career, prepare for the future, discover how usability evolves with AI and tech's rapid shift. Demystify heuristic evaluation, Nielsen's groundbreaking methods that still rock the design world. Shatter usability testing myths and learn how to integrate it for optimal outcomes. Conquer mobile design across diverse platforms and devices and master the art of balancing beauty and function, a design that delights and works. Plus, a peek into Dr. Nielsen's day and the heroes who had inspired him. Ready to unlock the secrets of user-centered design? Hit the play and join the Nodes of Design revolution. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning into Notes of Design. In this episode, we had a great honor and pleasure of hosting Jacob Nielsen with us. Hi Jacob, welcome to Notes of Design. Well, thank you so much. Great to be on the show. So how was your day so far, Jacob? So far, it's been very good. You know, it's uh, already evening now in California where I live, so dark, but otherwise good. That's wonderful. Like, what was your journey into design? How did you start? And what are your tips to the beginners in starting the design journey? I think those are two actually very different questions because I started 40 years ago when it was very different than today. And I started really, I was studying computer science, but I was very disappointed in the way that worked. I felt the computers were very oppressive and unpleasant to use. And so I thought that they could be better, more pleasant. I didn't necessarily think of usability as such right at that time. It was more a matter of pleasant or unpleasant. But I actually knew that it could be more pleasant because I'd had the experience of when I was in high school of using a much smaller computer, not, ne not nearly as powerful as what they gave the students at the university, but more pleasant. So that was, again, that emotional aspect. So then when I came to graduate school, I decided what should I focus on in my thesis. I decided on focusing on, on usability. And I read a few books, but there was not a lot available you know, 40 years ago. So I mainly had to invent it all myself. I mean, not saying I was the first at all. There were people who had written some books and there were definitely people who had done some you know, practical projects, but I didn't necessarily know about all that because I was in, in Denmark and most of that work had been done in, in the United States. So anyway, so I, so I started doing that as my graduate work and then I got more and more into it. And then I worked for a few years as a university professor. And then I got, I guess, a little bit tired of that because the truth was that all of my students, I had some actually very smart students and some of these guys have gotten very, very good jobs later. But right back then, and this is again 40 years ago, they couldn't get jobs. I mean, they got jobs as programmers because they were all very smart, but they couldn't get jobs as user interface designers because there was essentially no demand. I mean, there were, of course, user interfaces because any software you build will have a user interface, but the, the, but the interface was a side effect of the implementation. So therefore, you couldn't really call it design if by design you mean deliberately, intentionally uh, created for a purpose. Rather, it was a side effect of the implementation. 
So that was sad for me to teach all these smart people and then they couldn't get jobs at what I taught them. And anyway, so then I got a job in the United States at the telephone company and then I worked there for, for several years at their research laboratory, which was part of originally Bell Labs, which was sort of the, the most wonderful research laboratory in the history of the world, probably. Then I moved to Silicon Valley, got a job at Sun Microsystems, which was like the, like the center of the instant revolution. So I worked there for several years. Then I started, you know, my own company together with, with a colleague and worked there for many years. And then very recently, I've actually retired from kind of managing and just gone on my own. So that's sort of the entire big 40-year story in a few minutes. And today, that would not be, I would say, the, the recommended career path. So the recommended career path today, I think, are two separate ones depending on whether you are a student or you already are, you know, in the workforce. Because if you are in the workforce, then my recommendation is try to change your job into becoming more of a UX focus because, you know, you already have a job, as I'm assuming. So if you already have a job, that company, you can possibly help them a lot by starting to do more UX work as opposed to what is your kind of your current work. And then as that has results and as management sees that that's actually a good thing to do, then you can probably change into becoming a full-time UX person. The alternative is to like resign and start over again and get onto a boot camp or something. But that I think is is not the recommended way. Try try internally if you can. And then the other options, of course, if you're a student, then you know back when I was a student, there were no courses, but today there are. So that would be my recommendation. You know, take design courses, take UX courses. Preferably, you're in a design program. But even if not, you can take some. But then I would also recommend some other courses. And so there are things that are very important to for work that are not necessarily considered design, but things like communication, speaking and writing both. Communication is super important because you always work in a team and you always work with other people from other disciplines. You've got to be able to explain yourself. So communication is very important as that would be my number one, take some some writing and speaking courses. And then number two, I think statistics are actually interesting enough, also quite important. And that's very hard to learn on your own because it's really, really complicated. And so that's where actually having a formal course is, is helpful. So even if people don't like math, try to take a statistics course anyway if you can. That's some wonderful advice, Jacob. Thank you so much. How have the fundamental principles of web usability evolved to accommodate the rapid changes in the technology? And what do you believe is the next frontier in the evolution with the rise of AI? Yeah, well, I think that the basic principles of web design are actually basically the same as they've been for 25 years, or actually a little bit more. Well, actually, in the very, very beginning, the web was so new that it was not quite true. But ever since the web became big enough that it was overwhelming, you know, the main challenge in web design is that there's so many other places people can go. And also, ever since search engines became good, and that's, again, this 25 years ago, uh, it is so easy for people to find other places to go. So for all of those reasons, the number one guideline for web design is just get to the point and tell people what they want to know and don't confuse them or overburden them in a lot of elaborate fancy design. Scale, I mean, I've actually scaled back design is typically uh, the recommendation for web design. And also in terms of the writing of the content to the point, brief, concise, bulleted lists, highlighted keywords, good subheadlines, those type of things. So clear communication, get to the point, not a lot of elaboration or overhead. And I think when you're moving to AI, one of the benefits of AI is it has these abilities to summarize things and rephrase things and take information from many sources and compile them into one. And uh, because of that, I think that AI is going to completely replace the search engines. So because as you know, there's this old, old, old cliche saying that people don't want, you know, a nail, they want a hole in the wall or you want a place to hang something. And it's a little bit the same here. People don't really want to search. They want the answer. And um, so search engines will give you like 10 possible places to, to find the answer. And that's much better than, you know, 30 years ago at the very beginning of the web. So so that's why search has been so important for 25 years. And Google is still one of the most valuable companies in the world for that reason. But it's actually even better if the AI goes and reads those 10 sources and summarizes them and gives you just like the one you know, summary of all what are, what the most important people are saying about your question, and here's my advice for you. And that's what we're seeing happening now with services like, for example, Perplexity is one very good service that uses AI to replace search to just give you the answer right there. And of course, Google is going to do the same thing. So I cannot predict, you know, what in five or 10 years will be the name of the service you'll be using. The name of the service may be Google, it may be Perplexity, it may be something, a third name. But what it will do 
I don't think it will do search. It will give answers. Thank you so much, Jacob. So could you elaborate on the genesis and refinement of your heuristic evaluation methods and its enduring impact on the nuanced aspects of this modern web design? Yeah. Well, the heuristic evaluation comes actually from, that's that's very old, it's having the 30-year anniversary very soon. Uh, and so yeah, it came from me working on something I called discount usability or making cheap and fast usability. And uh, before then, the standard approach was to do very elaborate user testing. I'm still a big fan of user testing, so absolutely. But what I was saying was, in addition to user testing, we can also use you know, what we know about user interfaces, what we know about design, that some design works and some design doesn't work. We can, so what we know. And now there are many ways of knowing things. One of them is guidelines, and I've written many guidelines myself, so all in favor of guidelines. The problem is that there are really thousands of guidelines because there's so many de details in design. And so the truth is that you cannot really remember all the guidelines. Now, if you've got a design that says shopping cart or some particular screen, you can go up and look, you know, what are the 10 guidelines and 20 guidelines for that one thing? And that will be a useful thing to do. But in general, we can't really rely on people knowing 5,000 guidelines because nobody can remember that much. So my approach is that let's scale it back and take the 10 more most general things that describe as much as we can for what makes computers easy to use. And so that was what I was doing with the, with the heuristics. And actually the practical approach to doing that was, this is when I worked at the phone company. So I had a, a database of design problems in a lot of different software. And so there was a rather long list of different things that had gone wrong in different projects. And I was, I was sort of analyzing them and classifying them according to a large number of these guidelines. Then I was doing something that's called the factor analysis, which is a statistical technique to find out what are the main underlying dimensions to ex that, that span this uh, information space, which is like several hundred dimensions because there's so many things you can change the design. But again, that's also too complicated. So scale it back to the 10 most important. And then I say 10 most important, that doesn't mean it's 100%. It's heuristics. Heuristics means rules of thumb of general things. So they're not going to be 100%. I'll just admit that. And that's why I call it discount method, cheap, fast, simple method that helps you. It's not the final only one thing you should ever do. You should also do usability studies. You should also do other things. But it's a simple, quick thing. It's a, no a small number of things that you can therefore kind of remember and that can help you explain new things that come up. That's actually the other angle of them because they are very general. So the guidelines will be very specific. So a guideline would talk about, you know, like in the shopping cart, you got if people are going to not buy a product. What does it mean to not buy a product? I can tell you from the old days of e-commerce what you did, you would edit the quantity field to say zero. I want to buy zero copies of this product. Well, okay. No user would ever think that way other than a mathematician, you know, or maybe that engineer who implemented that, you know, shopping cart. So that was a complete failure. And so therefore we wrote this guideline that says you've got to have a button that says delete this. So next, next to everything you have your shopping cart, there's a button that says remove or delete. It can say different things, but it cannot be buy zero copies of this. It has to be removed from the shopping cart. So that's a guideline. But what if I'm going to do something completely different that has not been done before? Like maybe some AI system or maybe, you know, a, 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 a watch-based system. Now, they're not completely new anymore, but back when they were new, I'm not going to have these guidelines. But I can use the general heuristics because they came from before, you know, AI, before voice systems, before watch systems, but they, guess they still explain the design issues because they're general principles. Thank you so much, Jacob. So what are the most prevalent misconceptions about usability testing among the professionals? And how can organizations more effectively embed this practice into an iterative design process for best optimal outcomes? I think the main misconception is that you have to be very thorough. And I really recommend that you have to be very fast. And, you know, there is the consulting business. I was a consultant for many years. So the consulting business, there's sort of an old saying that says that clients want three things from a consultant. They want fast, cheap, and good. Well, fast, cheap, and good, three things you want, but you can only have two. You cannot have all three, right? Because if it's fast and cheap, it will be bad. Or if it's fast and good, well, then it will be expensive and so forth. Now, the thing about actually usability studies is you can actually, you can have all three because the fact that it's fast makes it cheap and, and makes it good, which is the interesting point. But you have to have a twist in the story. Because why is it good to do fast? For two reasons. First of all, it means you can do it early in your design project, which means well, that's when it's going to have a lot of impact. You know, if you discover one change that in, you want to make in the design before you've done anything, actually, let's say even before you've even drawn a single screen, then you can make the design completely different. If you discover it 
after everything has been coded and implemented, and even let's say shipped to the customers, while now you have a lot of resistance to make any change, and you're never, never going to make that change in reality. So the earlier you can discover an insight, the more you can change the design. Therefore, the better it is for the customer's user experience. That's one reason that fast is better, even though it's cheaper, it's also better. And the second reason is during the design process, which you know is a process, it, it takes a while. You could do many of these tests if each test is cheap, because any company, no matter how rich they are, they have a budget. And so if you take the entire budget and you spend it on one big study, well, you're going to get hopefully some good results on that, but one result or one set of insights. If you do 10 studies or 20 studies, one every week for a half year project, which would be 26 studies, man, you can change so much. And again, the goal of all this is user experience quality. Your goal is to do better for our users, for our customers. And so how do we do better for the customers? And this is iterative design is only thing that is actually because user interface design is so complicated. As I mentioned before that there are several hundred dimensions. I don't even know many hundreds. It's extremely complicated problem. And nobody, I mean, even the best designer in the world, and I want to say you probably don't have the best designer in the world working on your project. But even if you have a very, very good one, let's say, not the very best in the world, but the very, very good one, they still don't know everything. They still cannot manage in their heads these many hundreds of dimensions and many, many, many decisions and get all of those decisions perfect the very first time they try. And so that's why you do iterative design. And all good designers know this, that you try and then you try again and you keep improving and, and messing with it and making it better and better and better. And so the more iterations you, you can do, the better the result. And that's one of the true fundamental laws of nature about design is that the more iterations, the better the quality of the final result. But what does that mean? It means each iteration has to be fast. And that goes back to what I was saying before. You've got to do very fast, you know, uh, methods. Thank you, Jacob. So in the context of dominance of mobile internet usage, what key factors should be prioritized by designers to ensure seamless usability across diverse mobile platforms and devices? Well, I mean, this is where you want to do a lot of, of, of testing and have these devices available. And I also want to say that even though mobile is, is dominant, it's not the only thing. So one of the sad things I've, just, I've witnessed in web design for the last maybe 10 years or so is actually kind of like abandonment of desktop users. And that I feel is sad because it's still a big, big percentage of users, particularly office or business users who are often high value customers. And so you really have to remember both. And it, actually, I would even say you have to even also remember that some people who will be using watches or voice only interfaces, including, you know, blind users and people with various disabilities, so there's an accessibility issue as well. So we really have a lot of different platforms, not just Android versus uh, Apple for Apple OS or iOS. You know, that's one distinction, but you have also distinct between small and big screens and screen versus no screen. And now, as I said, we have this AI issue where you're going to have a lot of summarization done by these agents. Uh, and I think a lot more that even maybe only one or two years from now, that'll be a, a very major way of using web content. So the web, so the content has to be in some sense kind of scrapable or understandable by one of these agents. And so there's a lot of considerations there. And I think a lot of it is goes back to just kind of recognizing and not saying, well, I'm, because I have an Android phone, I'm going to design for that. Well, that's one use case, but remember that it's like in reality, hundreds of more. And so that's why having that flexibility is actually maybe the number one piece of advice, don't kind of knock it down to, it has to be exactly like this and look exactly only, can only look like this and everything else is a disaster. No, it, it'll scale big and small and up and down and, and so forth. And including, you know, remember even also the voice only uh, scenario. So Jacob, in your perspective, what is the nuanced metric or key performance indicator that offers the most insightful reflection of user experience on websites just beyond the conventional analytics? Ooh, uh, that's hard to say. Um, in many ways, because there are different usability parameters, and so it depends on what type of users you're talking about. For most websites, I really think it's learnability because most websites people don't use every day, and most websites are never dominated by that kind of initial user experience. Even if people used it, you know, three months ago, they can't remember when they come back. So therefore, that would be the initial user experience that you measure by you know, putting up a se series of, of tasks and then measure how many people can perform them, how fast they can perform them, and you can see if you can uh, improve those metrics over time. But there are also other tasks that are performed frequently, uh, and they tend to be more kind of an enterprise computing internal software. 
They can also be BPC software or even some cloud services, things that people use every day, like maybe email or if they are on some social media. There's a variety of things people use a lot anyway. And uh, But a lot of them are these work tools that you just use for your, for your job. And so for those, uh, the time on task really becomes the most important because if it takes you a day to learn something, if it's your job, you know, it would be better if it didn't, but it's okay. If it takes a day to learn a website, nobody will ever use it. <laughs> if it takes a minute to learn a website, nobody will ever use it actually, right? So, but but for, for job functionality, it's more important that every day you use it, it's fast and you don't get lost. And don't also, also don't make mistakes. But I would say time and task would be the most, most critical uh, indicator that you would, you would, you would uh, want to measure for enterprise computing. Thank you so much, Jacob. So how could designers design universal designs that are accessible and also support bilingual languages around the world? Ooh, well, if you really want to do it, I would say it's almost impossible without artificial intelligence, really, because there are hundreds of probably even thousands of languages. And so if you want to cover, you know, a very broad international scope of users, it's virtually impossible. You can't do it with translation and localization in the way that it was done in the past. Uh, I mean, there are plenty, plenty of guidelines for making the software that can be localized. Um, and of course, from my perspective as a usability person, I would say one of the things to do is to do international user testing. So with customers in your main markets, but again, it only will be the main markets. If Actually, most companies don't even do that, but if they're good, they might do like four or five different countries out of, you know, 200 or something like that. So it's, so it, it's not really, it's not feasible to do it truly universally. That's just pragmatically impossible. So therefore, you, that's why you had to rely on what I think we will, we will have uh, five to 10 years from now. I, I don't think right yet it's quite ready yet. But I think what you will do is you'll have something that's more of a, kind of a semantic description of what the UI is supposed to do. And then there will be a version of that UI actually created for the individual user. I call this individualization. And that also, by the way, will solve the accessibility problem because if the AI knows about the user, they'll know that user is, let's say, blind or if they have a motor skills problem so they can't move the mouse very, very accurately or whatever the, the issue may be. And then they can can create a user user interface that presents the same information, but in a way that's optimized for that user circumstances. So that would be the same if the user speaks one language or speaks another language, or if they can see pictures. If they cannot see pictures, they only have to rely on spoken words. If it's a blind person, for example. So so I think that if we really want to have universal design, it's actually impossible with human you no know, design work because it it's basically infinite. It's possible with AI because the computer scales, that's one of my kind of rules about artificial intelligence, AI scales, humans don't. So we have to think about what are things that right now do not get done because it's just too expensive and humans cannot do the work. If it's possible to do the work and not if all, everything will be possible, even with a slot AI, but if it's possible, if you want to do it one time or five times or a thousand times, it's all the same. It costs a little more computer time, but you know it's basically all the same to do a thousand times with AI, not with humans. That is a thousand times more expensive to do it a thousand times than one time. So again, if you want to have a, or let's say two hundred languages, well, that's two hundred times more expensive than one language. That will never get done with AI. I think it will get done. So that's my prediction. Actually, it's only a prediction because it's not the technology is not really there yet. Uh, but that is my that's how I think we'll solve this problem because it just cannot be solved pragmatically speaking now. So what you're doing we're doing is we're doing this kind of second best, which is to say, well, we can't really support everybody, so we'll sort of go by our biggest markets, you know, biggest country first, the second country biggest, and then you go down and you do ten of your big company, you do twenty or thirty. You know, some of the a very few products that ship in like a hundred languages. It's almost none, especially like probably Windows and Google and I don't know the maybe Wikipedia or something. But it's very, very few anyway. Um, and that's enormous work for those you know, those few places. And that's only possible because they're so enormously you know, well funded, have so much, enormously much staff and so many users. So yeah, for any normal project, it cannot be done now, and I think it will be done. Uh, Five years, maybe 10 years is hard to say. Actually five, because AI is moving faster than anybody ever thought. So maybe five, five years. Thank you, Jacob. So how do you propose designers should navigate the intersection of emerging design trends and fundamental principles of usability to create both aesthetically appealing and functionality robust designs? Yeah, well, I think you, as you point out, you really have, have that duality, the tension between the two. 
And um, I mean, the first thing is just to recognize it, which a lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of people just have that, oh, I'm just pursuing the cutting edge, bleeding edge, and it's going to look amazing, but be terrible to use. Or maybe other people will be like, I used to be 20 years ago. So the opposite of saying, well, I'm very conservative. I'm not going to do anything new. Uh, and, and neither of those approaches are, are really you know, satisfactory. But I do think that the fundamentals are fundamental for a reason. And so that is still why I think you should be anchored. And the benefit of the fundamentals that we talked before about the, the 10 heuristics, I mean, they're 30 years old. Like 29 right now will be 30 years old next year. And they're the same. And they're the same for a reason because they're fundamental. And so in terms of education or building up your skill sets, you know, understanding the fundamentals, that'll pay off. 30 years from now, you'll still be using the fundamentals. The current fashion, two years from now, you won't even be using that. So the payoff is lower from chasing the fashion. The payoff is high from chasing the, fun or learning the fundamentals, not even chasing them because they're there. They don't move. They're, they're constant. And so I really recommend getting a good, sound, solid handle on the fundamentals because they are, they're fundamental for a reason, basically. I mean, there were certainly fashions 25 years ago, but we don't know them today because they're long gone, so they're not worth studying. The fundamentals that survived from 30 years ago, from 20 years ago, from 10 years ago, they are the ones that are worth studying. And then you've got to think about, oh, how, how can we modify them or change them, adapt them to the current circumstances? But that's always much easier than if you don't know the fundamentals and you're trying to like invent everything from scratch. You don't have to invent everything from scratch because user interfaces and UX and established discipline, and it's not the first design. Or, you know, in the United States, they have this saying, it's not my first rodeo. It's not the first time I'm trying to catch a cow. I mean, you've done it before. And so we can do it again. And and building on that knowledge and that those lessons, that is how you become more efficient the next time and the third time and the 100th time you do something. Thank you so much, Jacob. So how do you envision the evolution of user experience design, particularly in terms of adapting to AI-driven interfaces and intelligent interfaces? Yeah, I think that we will have a new style of user interface, actually. Uh, so the first thing to recognize is that AI is in its own right a very revolutionary thing in user interfaces because in the past, we had very command-oriented user interfaces. So we would tell the computer what to do. And computers would be like, you know, the ideal soldier in the army. Yes, sir. And they would just do exactly what was told. And you know, mo no, most people don't do exactly as they're told, right? But you, computers are very obedient. They'll do exactly as they're told. Well, that's good and bad, right? Because you don't always tell them exactly the right thing because that's the, the difficulty. That's the usability problem that we don't understand the commands. So we issue a command without knowing what it will actually do. But in principle, the computer always does exactly as it's told. That means you put together a sequence of steps, do this, do that, move this thing up a little, make it red, make it bigger, whatever it is. So we tell it all these steps. Well, with AI, it changes from command-based to intent-based interaction. So I'll tell the computer what I want. I want something that looks like a mail truck, or I want something that, you know, this or that or the other. And if it's not quite right, I say, well, may then I can say make it bigger. But I start by just saying my intent. With traditional computing, traditional user interfaces, you do step by step by step, sometimes hundreds of steps, each one small command with AI, intent. What do what, what is the result I want? I describe that to the computer. So that's a huge revolution. Now, the problem with that is that then you have to describe what you want. You, you don't get anything for free. So you have to describe what you want. And that's called articulation. And articulation, there's an articulation barrier, which is that it's actually hard to describe what you want in, 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 you know, in enough elaborate detail. And so what I actually predict happens is there will be a uh, merger of these two interaction styles, what I call a hybrid user interface. So it will have some intent base, some prompting. I say what I want, but it will also have some uh, graphical user interface because graphical user interfaces are superior. I mean, we're, they've been with us for 40 years now, and that's not a uh, you know, coincidence. I mean, before then you had things like DOS and Unix and, and command lines and whatever. And that's really what we reverted to in the AI. Now it's natural language, so it's easier than DOS, but it's still typing out on a line of text what you want. And so that merger of a graphical user interface and the intent-based prompting, that's what I believe will have. But that's not what we get in something like chat TPT. These so-called chatbots are very um, line-based, but that's what we are seeing already emerging in some of the more graphical design tools. And I feel like if you think ahead, probably only one year, but, but not a lot anyway, I think we'll have this... A hybrid user interface style emerging. And that, of course, becomes a design challenge because uh, you want to take the best of both worlds, 
then it will have a great use, high usability. But there's just as much a risk of getting the worst of both worlds. When you marry two things, you could take some from, from group A and some from group B and you make a new user interface. And we don't know how to do it. That's the truth. And so that requires a lot of experimentation. I'm very hopeful about this. I, I think it can create dramatically more user empowerment, which is really what this is about. I mean, there's so many things. It's about, you know, increase the sales of your e-commerce sites and your conversion rate or whatever. But ultimately, you know, User experience is about the user's experience and about empowering the user, making them capable of using technology and using technology for more than they could before so that they can now do more things than they could before. Uh, and they don't feel oppressed by technology, but they feel enabled by technology. Well, all these are very nice ideals, but to make that happen, that's what requires that good design. And it, and there's certainly a risk that we get the terrible design that's, that's impossible to use and only the most intelligent people can use it. And the, 98% of the population cannot use it and so forth. That's, but that, that's not what I believe in. I mean, I believe we will get that, that the best of both worlds. It just doesn't happen by itself. This is why it's called design. You've got to create it. So, But I, I do believe that. That's what I believe in. That's what I think we'll have in one year, maybe two years. And I'm pushing for it to be one year. Maybe it'll be two years because, you know, not everything goes like I want, but that's what I hope for. Thank you so much, Jacob, for sharing all these wonderful insights. So we got this question from a lot of our listeners, like, could you please share with us how does your day look like and how do you still keep yourself updated to the latest innovations in the design industry? Ah, yes, yes. Well, I mean, some of it is what's called serendipity, which is randomness. And I feel you have to like embrace randomness. You can't always have everything be 100% deliberate. So I just kind of often I just browse the web and I say, oh, here's an interesting thing. And I click on it and then sometimes it turns out to be not very good. And then I leave as quickly as I can. You know, that's again what people do with websites. If it's not good, 20 seconds, you're out of there. But I try to look at as many different things as I can. I feel like there's a lot of very broad-based innovation happening these days. And so try to keep keep up with that, I think, is, is, is really important. But then you have to have the other side of that, which is the, like the thinking of reflection. And for, for me, that happens a lot when I'm writing. Um, this is different for different people. I just happen to be a very kind of verbal type of person. Not many other people are very visual, so they would sketch out things each to each their own, you know, but whatever you do. But I think you have to reflect on it. You can't just like have a list for a fire hose of things. I'm at you, come at you, more, more. There's always more. You never end. You cannot have the bad conscience of not having read the entire internet today. That cannot happen. It can never happen. In the really old days, we would get, I got a printed newspaper delivered, you know, into my house every day. I would look through every page of the newspaper, but you can't do that with the internet. You cannot look through every page of the internet. It is impossible. So you just got to kind of control yourself and spend some time reflecting. I feel that's very, very important. And then another thing about, this is about my personality. I'm just never satisfied. And I mean, the truth is, if I really want to think about it, User interfaces today are so much better than when I started 40 years ago. They have really come a long way. So why don't I say, oh, yeah, this is good now. Now we can be happy. No, because I know they can be even better. And so I always know it can be even better. Every time I see a stupid design or, you know, something that doesn't follow the guidelines, I get, like, upset about it. I say, why didn't they do it right? And then I write a scathing, you know, comment or something like that that gets further for another article. So... Yeah, so I never, I'm never satisfied. I feel like you, you cannot. I mean, you shouldn't be like angry, right? But, but you should, you should never be satisfied either, because it can always get better. The perfect user interface does not exist. I mean, I kind of like, like to say that the perfect user interface is like one big red button, and the screen says, "Do my work for today." Click, and you go home, because you, it's done my work for today. But even that wouldn't actually be the perfect user interface because it wouldn't be satisfying to just do your work by one click. So, you know, honestly, that's not even the perfect user interface either. So that it can always be better. That's my bottom line. Thank you, Jacob. So we'll conclude this show by your three favorite book recommendations and people who inspire you the most in this space. Ooh, uh, but the sad thing is I don't read so many books anymore. Uh, that's maybe a complete uh, an admission because I, I used to. Uh, and this is actually one of the really downsides of the web and social media and all those things is they do tend to like get you to chase the chase the tail of, of something a little bit too much. So I can't really give you three good recent books because I haven't been reading them, which I'm ashamed to say. But I do think, you know, I, 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 I follow, you know, some a lot of people on, on LinkedIn, you know, and um, some of those people really do provide in reality books worth of, of content every month. So, so that's really what I'm doing these days. And uh, people who inspire you the most in your journey? Oh, well, 
I had to actually go back to some of the real pioneers there because when I got into this entire work, a lot of this was due to a guy named uh, Ted Nilsson, and this is Nilsson, not Nilsen, so it has no relation to me, but very similar name. But Ted Nilsson is a guy who invented hypertext, and um, he never actually built it. You know, he only wrote about it, but he invented the idea, and then other people built it, like Apple and so forth. But And, of course, Tim Berners-Lee and the World Wide Web was a big implementation of hypertext. But the ideas are, are much older. And so back when I was a computer student and I was sort of thinking what I should do, I, I read his books and he wrote a book called Dream Machines, which is that's just a name, Dream Machines, right? It was about computers to liberate the mind. And uh, that was extremely inspiring to me. And um, another another person I'll mention is kind of my, my, my mentor, John Gould. Uh, he was with IBM. He's actually retired now because I'm an old guy and so my mentor was an even older guy. But... but um, he was great because he was a classical psychologist and um, he knew he could figure out anything you wanted to study. He could figure out a way to study it. And that kind of taught me that lesson that never give up because even if it seems like it's complicated and it's a new thing that has never been done before, you can find a way. If you're just willing to watch users, that's the only thing. You've got to have humans involved, watch watch people. And so that was extremely inspiring to me. And then I can I can mention you know, other people who have done, you know, great work, you know, over the many years. Uh, you know, my my old colleague Don Norman has a great inspiration to me and among younger people, some somebody like like Sarah Gibbons, who is like like a super great designer who I'm even right right as we speak, I'm writing an article with her uh, so that younger generation, there's an enormous amount of talent that I feel is very inspiring as well. Uh, but we should also not forget those pioneers, though. So I feel like those people who worked back in the in the 70s and 80s, you know, they would be. It was before most of these things were really possible, but they thought about what could be, and that was very, very inspiring to me. And so I've been kind of part of, of that making it happen. So I feel like this, that those are the two types of people I mentioned, like the old timers who kind of set the stage for it can be, and the new timers who are like just so awesome and much better than we could ever have thought. I mean, like I mentioned, Sarah Gibbons, I could not have imagined really that 30, 40 years ago there would be people you know that good doing this type of work, but there are. You know, we have. It, and this is not the only one, obviously, but she happens to be one I, I know personally and I know kind of like to work with. So many, many people like that. Thank you so much, Chico, for sharing all these wonderful insights with us. So we are looking forward to host you again in our upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you and thanks for having me. Great show. 